Hi, welcome to this English Gorillas revision clip about Of Mice and Men. We're going to be thinking about candy today. Okay, um, we're not going to look at everything to do with candy in the novel, but we're going to look at a few key sections, a few key pages, where I think you can make some interesting points about how Steinbeck portrays him here. If we look at pages 86 to 88, first of all, this is where Candy's jog has just been shot, and uh, Candy joins in with George and Lenny and the dream, um, and becomes part of it all. Um, he's in a very vulnerable position at this point, it's worth noting, um, because his dog has just been shot, you know, because of the situation that he's in. And the first thing that I would say is just look at how desperate he is. He's prepared to offer George and Lenny all his money, everything that he's got saved up, all his wages, every, all the compensation money that he got when he um, lost his hand in an accident, okay, everything. And it's, it's astonishing that he's prepared to do that when he's only just met them. It's easy for us to forget that in a way because we've spent kind of 80 pages or whatever within the novel getting to know George and Lenny and we feel a degree of sympathy with them and we feel to some extent we can trust them as characters. Candy's in a worse position than us as readers. He's only just met these guys, okay, and he's prepared to offer them everything. He must, there must be hundreds, thousands of men that must come through the ranches every day, every week, every month. And Candy must have seen tons of them come through before. But these two men, for some reason, he's prepared to offer them everything. And one of the things we could say is just how desperate he must be at that point because he's facing an old age of insecurity and vulnerability. He recognises that very soon he's going to be treated, well, basically worse than his dog. They're not going to shoot him, OK? They're going to they're gonna can him, they're going to, you know set him out on, yeah, out on the streets, basically, so he's, he's not going to be able to, to even work for a living anymore. So his desperation is evident, and his willingness to trust all his money to the two men that he's only just met. The second thing is, I think the adverbs are interesting on this page. Um, if you think a few pages back, uh, before his dog was shot, uh, Steinbeck uses lots of adverbs like softly, nervously, helplessly, uncomfortably, to talk about the way that uh, Candy is speaking and the way that he's acting. Here, look at the way that he's speaking now. He, there are adverbs like excitedly and eagerly. You can see this transformation in Candy. Suddenly he's got hope. And because he's got hope, I think there's a sense in which we as readers get sucked into believing as well. Notice uh, one of the th interesting things with Candy is obviously that he's got his hand chopped off, he's got, so he's got this stump, hasn't he? And it, I don't know if you noticed, but very, very often at key points in the novel, Steinbeck draws attention to that stump. And here there's a moment where it says, he scratched the stump of his wrist nervously. And I think the stump, the handlessness, if you like, kind of represents his vulnerability, it represents his powerlessness. And so at this point, is it kind of maybe suggesting that, you know, does he dare to believe in the possibility of rising out of his position of vulnerability? You know, it, it, is it kind of Steinbeck saying, look, look how weak he's been, look how vulnerable he's been. Does he dare to believe that he could rise up out of that in some way through going in with George and Lenny and becoming part of the dream? On page 88, um, it's interesting that uh, it constantly repeats, it, re repeats this phrase, our own place. Um, look at what he says. He says, um, maybe if I give you guys my money, you'll let me hoe in the garden even, I, even after I ain't no good at it. And I'll wash dishes and little chicken, stuff like that. But it'll be our own place. And I'll be let to work on our own place, he said miserably. You know, there's very much that focus on this is our own place, our own place. What he dreams of is belonging. And if we're relating that to... Uh, the plight of itinerant workers, migrant workers in 1930s America. That's what they crave. Yeah, they crave this sense of belonging because they're constantly moving around from ranch to ranch. Everything's transitory, nothing's fixed. Um, and so what they crave is that sense of permanence and that sense of belonging because it's what they don't have. Um, if you look at when he's uh, uh, kind of pleading his case, if you like, to George and Lenny, it says he's constantly, he's constantly apologising. He's constantly kind of admitting his weakness and his vulnerability. Twice, he says, I ain't much good. He then says, maybe if I give you guys my money, you'll let me hoe in the garden, even, if, even after I ain't no good at it. He's pleading. He's asking for 
financial, physical and social security and support in his old age. And again, his desperation is shown here by the way in which he pleads. He's begging for it. That's how desperate he is. If you look at when he talks about uh, the, 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 employ his, the boss, talks about his employers and talks about the way that they all treat him as well. He, again, his dependence is emphasised twice. It says, they give me. Yeah? And it says, they'll can me. They'll put me. Look at those sentences on these pages. They'll, they'll give me. They'll can me. They'll put me. Constantly, he's the passive victim at the mercy of others. It's like as if he's, he's if we think of the, 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 the word order of the sentence, it's like he's positioned as the object of the sentence, the part of the sentence that's having something done to it or to him. Yeah? They are in control of me. So they will give me. They'll can me. They'll put me. But he is constantly in that passive dependent, vulnerable position. Okay, let's look at page 90 now. Um, and this is a really interesting bit because it's just before Curly and Lenny's fight at the end of chapter three. And uh, it's interesting because about power, really, I suppose. Uh, Curly has gone and, and tried to accuse Slim of having some fling with his wife. And Slim is not having any of it. He's saying, no, I wasn't anywhere near her. Um, and the, the, some of the other guys are joining in as well, and they come back into the bunkhouse, and let's just read a little bit. It says, so this is the top of page 90. Um, this is Curly talking at the moment. He says, I'm just trying to tell you, I didn't mean nothing, said Curly. I just thought you might have saw her. Why don't you tell her to stay the hell home where she belongs, said Carlson. You let her, let her hang around bunkhouses, and pretty soon you're going to have someone on your hands, and you won't be able to do nothing about it. Curly whirled on Carlson. You keep out of this, lest you want to step outside. Carlson laughed. You goddamn punk, he said. You try to throw a scare on the Slim, and you can make it stick. Slim throw a scare on you. You're yellow as a frog belly. I don't care if you're the best weller in the country. You come for me, and I'll kick your goddamn head off. And then look at the next bit. Candy joined the attack with joy. Glove full of Vaseline, he said disgustedly. Curly glared at him. Now, at this point, Curly is trying to... Um, as in Carlson's word, throw a scare into Slim, okay? Curly is trying to intimidate Slim and saying, you've been messing around with my wife. Of course, Slim hasn't. Slim is innocent, or at least that's what we suspect. But Curly has, is not succeeding in, in intimidating Slim. He's not succeeded in intimidating Carlson. In fact, now in front of everyone, um, Slim is ignoring him. Carlson is actively mocking him and laughing at him. So in front of everyone, Curly's now in a very sort of precarious, vulnerable position. Curly really values his status and his standing in front of the other men. He tries to bully them. He uses uh, fear of uh, physical conflict and fear that he will uh, uh, grasp them up to his, his dad, who's the boss. He constantly uses those as tools to, um, to threaten the others, doesn't he? Here, can you imagine how he feels at this moment, being potentially utterly humiliated? But look what happens now. Candy then joins the attack. Candy, one of the weakest characters. Yeah? So sort of think about the, the, the four weakest characters that are then mentioned in Chapter 4, which is Crooks, because he's black, Lenny, because he's learning difficulties, Curly's wife, because she's a woman, and Candy, because of his old age and his disability. He's one of the four weakest characters, and here he is mocking Curly, the boss's son. Yeah? And so what he does is he provokes him to seek to reassert his authority and status. And that, so that, this is what causes Curly to then pick a fight with Lenny. Yeah, Curly's desperate. Curly's just been ridiculed by old Stumpy, by Candy. Yeah? It says Curly glared at him, and then it says... His eyes slipped on past and lighted on Lenny. And Lenny was still smiling with delight at the memory of the, of the ranch. This is the excuse Curly needs now to pick a fight with Lenny, this huge, great, big bloke, to reassert himself, hopefully by defeating him in a fight. And therefore, no one will laugh at Curly anymore. Of course, it goes terribly wrong from Curly's point of view. And he ends up having his hand completely crushed in Lenny's paw, doesn't he? Okay. Um... But what's interesting here 
is the the role that Candy plays. He acts as a kind of trigger, therefore, doesn't he, for the fight between Curly and Lenny. So in the terms of his role in the narrative, can you see the place that Candy plays here, the role that he plays? Um, Steinbeck, I think, is also providing insight into human nature. This isn't the only moment in the novel, is it, where the victims of oppression relish, relish the opportunity to become the oppressor. Okay? Um, think about uh, Crooks in chapter four when it says his face lighted with pleasure in his torture when he's kind of taunting Lenny about the possibility that George won't come back. Yeah. Um, look at Curly's wife taking the opportunity to lay into to Crooks again in chapter four. The oppressed becoming the oppressor. Now, I don't know about you, but I find it very, very difficult to forgive Curly's wife for the way that she treats Crooks in chapter four because of the, the blatant racism i find it very difficult um to when Cro when crooks uh starts taunting uh lenny in chapter four as well i mean you can you can kind of forgive it because it's then placed within the context of his utter desperation and loneliness and the way that he's been treated by others maybe yeah here is it perhaps a little bit more understandable is it a kind of like is it a form of vengeance maybe is it is it Candy getting his own back on one of the, one of the men, you know, that, that has been in a position of power over him? You know, Candy, one of the most vulnerable characters. Here he's placed, he's given an opportunity to, to get his own back on, on someone that, that frankly, as, as readers, we think of as, as, a, as a vile, quite abusive man. I don't know, it's kind of interesting to look at how we respond to Candy's taunting of Curly at this point, Crooks taunting Lenny and Curly's wife's abuse of Crooks. You know, in some ways, those three situations are similar, but it's worth questioning yourself as to how and why you might respond in different ways. Um, and maybe your attitude towards different kinds of abuse, whether it's abuse of power and class, or race, or based on sexism, you know, maybe they influence your response to it. I think that's quite interesting. Okay, next bit, page 110 to 112. This is his interactions with Curly's wife. Um, Candy responds to Curly's wife's derogatory comments here. At one point then, in chapter four, this is, she says, I'm it's Saturday night, everybody's out doing something, and I'm stuck here with all the weak ones, she says. Um, with a, a nigger and dum dum and a lousy old sheep, she says, doesn't she? Referring, using you know, very derogatory language to kind of squash them down according to their race and their learning difficulties and their age. And she calls Candy here this lousy old sheep. Um, and what Candy seeks to do then is to reassert himself, yeah, in a situation where there's a kind of jostling for power between the weakest characters on the ranch. I kind of, I, I really like to think of chapter four as almost like a bit of an experiment on Steinbeck's part, that he decides to, he kind of gets to the end of chapter three and thinks, well, what do I do now? I know, I'll send everyone off into Soledad for the evening, and I'm left with these four characters, the four weakest ones. I wonder what they'll do. I wonder how they'll interact with each other. And it's fascinating. Look at how when uh, Curly's wife is, is mocking uh, Candy and Crooks and Lenny, Look at how Candy stands up for himself and for the others. And look at how Steinbeck uses physical movement and positioning to emphasise this assertion of power. Um, it's on page 110. Yeah? Um, it says, Crooks had retired into the... 111, rather. Crooks had retired into the terrible protective dignity of the Negro. But a change came over old Candy. He stood up suddenly and knocked his nail keg over backward. I had enough, he said angrily. You ain't wanted here. We told you you ain't. And I tell you, you got floozy ideas about what us guys amounts to. You ain't got sense enough in that chicken head to, to, to even see that we ain't stips. Um, and he goes on. But look at how he stands up. Yeah, he's, he's standing up to her in a kind of metaphorical sense. But Steinbeck is emphasising that assertion of power by him standing up in a physical sense as well. Look at the top of page 112. Look at the repeated use of the first person plural pronoun we. Yeah. Um, think back to how important though that, that we pronoun was when George and Lenny were recounting the dream to each other back in chapter one. 
And now look at it. Look at Candy talking. He says, suppose you get us, Ken. Suppose you do. You think that we'll hit the highway and look for another lousy two-bit job like this? You don't know that we got our own ranch to go to and our own house. We ain't got to stay here. We got a house and chickens and fruit trees and a place a hundred times prettier than this. And we got friends. That's what we got. Maybe there was a time when we were scared of getting canned, but we ain't no more. We got our own land, and it's ours, and we, go, we can go to it. Yeah? Look at the we. There's constantly there's that sense of togetherness, that strength in union and partnership, that companionship and solidarity. It's all about independence from an employer that's going to abuse them, creating that sense of belonging, Look at that. Look at that use of the word our. Look, it's our own house, our own ranch, our own land. And then just in case you missed it, ah, oh, it's ours. Yes, yeah, kind of like really, really emphasizing this is ours. You can't take it away from us. Yeah. Um, Kelly's wife um, rejects. Um, oh, sorry, C Candy rejects um, Kelly's wife's attempt to label them. And he then seeks to dismiss her as a child. He says, you better go, just go along and roll your hoop now. He also rejects her as a submissive wife. He says, maybe Curly ain't going to like his wife out in the Valm of Us Bindle Slips. And he, tri he dismisses her as trivial and sexually promiscuous. You've got floozy ideas in your head. Think of the kind of the, the floozy suggests kind of fluffy and insubstantial, as in being trivial. You know, your, your head's just full of silly little things, you silly little girl is the implication, isn't there? Okay, but also floozy suggests, like a prostitute, being sexually promiscuous, yeah? In both cases, he's guilty, therefore, of y using sexism as a tool, isn't he? There's quite misogynistic attitudes coming across here. Look, so he treats the only woman, really, that we ever get to see. He treats her as a child. He, he says, you better submit. And he says, you're trivial and fluffy and insubstantial and you're sexually promiscuous. He uses all the kind of most common tools at his disposal to, to, to squash her and to dismiss her, doesn't he? Um, Curly's wife responds initially by laughing at her. He, she says, baloney, I've seen too many of you guys. If you had two bits in the world, you'd be getting two shots of comedy and sucking the bottom of us. I know you guys. But look at Candy again. It's all about power. Candy's face had grown redder and redder, but before she was done speaking, he had control of himself. He was the master of the situation. And I kind of wonder whether that word master there, again, is another kind of quite loaded term to do with gender. Again, you know, he, Candy is very much using his status as a man to... Uh, to destroy her as a woman at this point and to stand up against her. Okay, pages 131 to 133, finding Curly's wife's body. Uh, Candy comes in then, sees Curly's wife's body in the barn after Lenny has killed her. And there's this line where it says, now Candy spoke his greatest fear. Now what's his greatest fear? Well, his greatest fear is that his, he, the, the dream is dead that he, he will no longer have that hope of companionship and social security and friendship. He can dismiss all that. It's back to living on the streets and being dependent on handouts. No one is going to be there to look after him in his old age because that's what the kind of harsh society of 1930s America is like. Yeah? Look at page 131. Look at the repeated interrogatives, just the posh term for questions. Look at when he says, middle of page 131, it says... You and me can get that little place, can't we, George? You and me can go there and live nice, can't we, George? Can't we? Look, it's question, question, question. There's this desperate pleading like a dependent child. Again, showing his vulnerability, isn't it? Look at page 132. Um, when he, George has then left, okay, and uh, he's just confronted with Curly's wife's dead body again, and he gets the opportunity to speak to her. And he says... You goddamn tramp. You done it, didn't you? I suppose you're glad. Everybody knows you'd mess things up. You wasn't no good. You ain't no good now, you lousy tar. Um, at that point, I kind of wonder whether Steinbeck is using Candy as a kind of mouthpiece for the resentment and the anger that we feel as readers. I don't know, because maybe you respond in a very different way, but part of me kind of wants to, to blame Curly's wife because... If she hadn't been in there, if she hadn't been stupid enough to, to let Lenny stroke her hair, then, well, the dream could all go ahead and George and Lenny and Candy could all live happily ever after. Yeah. And so 
Candy blames Curly's wife there, doesn't he? And part of us as readers wants to blame her with him. Or is that me just being a misogynistic, sexist male English teacher? You know, is that what men always do? You know, blame women. I mean, think about it. Is that, is, 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 is that you know, look at it. It's not Curly's wife's fault, is it? I mean, it might be, it might be uh, Lenny's fault. You know, if he's, he's the one that's killed her, isn't he? Maybe it's George's fault for not supervising Lenny. Maybe it's Curly's fault because Curly's wife's so miserable that she's seeking attention from other people in the first place. You know, but, you know all of them potentially could be for, to blame. Is it really Curly's wife's fault? That's who Candy seeks to blame. So in terms of kind of like the way that men and women are represented here, again, it's interesting, isn't it? Look at page 133, though. This is a, he, 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 initially he's, he responds with anger, but then he starts crying because he's, he's, he's grieving the dream that's died. And it says, his eyes blinded with tears, he turned and went weakly out of the barn and he rubbed his briskly whiskers with his wrist stump. And it's the, we're back to that wrist stump again, aren't we? And it's this symbolic reminder from Steinbeck of Candy's return to a position of complete vulnerability, in that the lack of a hand, again, represents his return to powerlessness. If you found that useful, then please like it and subscribe to English Gorillas. Thanks a lot.